Greetings from Albert Wisner Library in Warwick, New York, and welcome to our program, Dressing Like Indians, a panel discussion on reenacting history. Our panelists this evening are Martin Seniga, supervisor of Colonial Williamsburg's Native American Initiative, Drew Shuptar Ravis, reenactor and cultural ambassador of the Pocomoke Indian Nation, Jonathan Yellowbear, tribal elder, reenactor, and educator of Eastern Abenaki culture, and Lawrence Wood, commander of Hathorne's Minutemen reenactment unit. Thank you all for being here to help us learn and understand. As we move towards the nation's 250th anniversary, our panelists are here today to discuss the portrayal of Native Americans within the reenactment and living history communities. We're all concerned today about the need to be more inclusive of the experience of different racial and cultural groups in our understanding of history. Reenactors and event coordinators are challenged to find ways to accomplish that in a respectful and accurate way, particularly if those people who portray Native Americans are not of that racial ancestry. The practice of white Americans dressing as Indians goes back to the earliest days of colonization by Europeans. And studies have been done about this cultural practice, such as Rana Green's historical survey, a tribe called Wannabe in 1988. We recognize there are no easy answer to our questions this evening and that these complex issues are very deeply rooted, but we can discuss them and hope to move forward. And now to our panel. And uh, I think we will take the order that you appear on the screens. I don't know if you see the same order on your screen, but first up is Mr. Yellow Bear. The first question is, please briefly share our audience uh, with our audience why you became a reenactor educator of Native American lives of the past. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, um, I'm honored to be here and thank you for showing up and, and supporting this uh, venue. Uh, well, I got, I got involved in the reenacting at a very early age. Um, my dad started it. Uh, he uh, made the mistake of taking me to when I was just probably four or five years old to the Lexington and Concord reenactment uh, when we lived in Lexington. And that was back in the 70s uh, before the, well, I guess that was after the, after the 76. So that was 77, 78, somewhere in there. So we, we went there and I told dad, I told my dad, I said, I would love to do that. Something like that, but not, maybe not that, but I wasn't sure where I was going to go. And then our grandmother, uh, my grandmother, my mom's mom, told us that we had Abnaki heritage and that started my pursuit of the lineage process and, and learning all I could about our tribal lineage because we never grew up on a reservation or near a reservation. So it's been a long journey. It's been 45 years plus learning and 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 being in, con in conversation and in direct contact with other Abenaki people and histor histor Abenaki historians and whatnot. So that's how I got started. And since I started out at an early age, I think my focus was more uh, with authenticity and making sure that, that what I did was portraying the ancestors in a respectful way and not um, um, not coming up with this Hollywood image of of a generic Indian. All right. Like we always we always see this on TV and it drives me absolutely nuts. <laughs> so so Drew can attest to this. I'm sure everybody else can attest to this. That, that when we are doing our portrayals, we are doing it in the most historically accurate fashion that we can, that we have access to the information that we, we've been able to uncover. So that's, that's, that's how, we've, how I've, I've approached it. And okay. now, now that I'm old, 
Uh, I have been affectionately called an elder now and just blows my mind. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so that's, that's how I started. I started okay. out as a, as a young kid. Okay. Mr. Chuptar Ravis, can you share your story? Sure. Um, Um, for me, um, I became involved with living history and reenacting at the age of 19. Um, as a youth, I had always loved history, um, all kinds of history growing up, um, as well as a healthy love for the outdoors, um, ancestral skills such as flint napping, fire making, building bows and arrows, debris shelters, um, which I all learned in my early teens. Um, funny enough, I got good enough at it. I was 16 years old and I was working at a wilderness skills camp in um, upstate New York. And they actually called my mom because they said, you know, he's as good as the instructors. Can he stay for an <laughs> extra week so that he can help teach the other kids who are here? Um, so I was always, I, so I was very tickled at that. And especially at 16, you know, how cool you get to be on your own and be an adult for a little while. Um, and it wasn't really till my late teens, my middle to late teens, um, I was always very, very interested okay, have in. Your attention, please. The library is closed in the right. minutes. All public computers will shut down at 45. I'm going to step away from the camera a moment. Continue, please. Sure. Um, and so it was probably my middle to late teens. You know, I always had this interest in the 17th and 18th century. And it wasn't until I was at my uncle's house and I watched 1992's Last of the Mohicans that at 15, you couldn't have told me any different. Um, <laughs> from the time I was 15 to 19, I, I was trying to figure out how do I get involved? How do I do this? How, um, because I didn't grow up with my tribal community. I came to my tribal community much later. Um, I grew, off, grew up off my traditional homelands. Um, I and my first cousins were the first not to be born in either Maryland or Pennsylvania since the 1690s. So, uh, this living history for me was a way to connect with my ancestors, with my family, with um, my, you know, my heritage. And so it was really important for me. Um, so living history was one of those ways exactly that I could be native and I could be proud of my heritage, even though at the time I didn't have my community to fall back on. Um, over the years, living history and interpreting the life of my Algonquian ancestors has been one of the most humbling, healing heartwarming, proud, academic, and beautiful things I've ever done in my life. Um, that being said, my experience viewing and participating in events where Native personas have occurred has been a mixed one. I think the biggest thing in large reenactments where most of the quote-unquote Natives are non-Native is their complete and utter focus solely on war and combat and very little daily life, culture, and trade. Granted, and I understand this, that these events often circulate around the recreation of a historic battle or conflict, but it's two-dimensional <clears throat> and requires no depth to go on the field, shoot one's piece and give a yell, and return back to camp while then taking pictures with tourists. You know, this in turn gives the public the false idea that all we did as Native people was fight and make war. Um, and lastly, the large amounts of people with incredibly inaccurate clothes claiming to represent Native people is also incredibly insulting as it gives the public false ideas of historical accuracy when it comes to Eastern Woodland people. Thank you, Drew. Lawrence, how, how did you get started in the reenactment community? <clears throat> well, I was, I, was, uh, I was raised in upstate New York and uh, right down the road from where I lived was a, uh, a fort called the Oldstone Fort. So as a child, every year in October, my father would take me to this event called the Burning of the Valleys, you know, where, uh, you know, Brant and his braiders and his Mohawks and stuff came down through burnt, you know, the, the, <clears throat> the scary valley and stuff like that. And every year about that time, I would be on my best behavior. So my father would take me to this event, you know, because I loved it. <laughs> and I said to myself, one day I am going to do this and of course it was many 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 years later and i've always had a love for history you know drew mentioned the last of the mohicans <laughs> my favorite book of all times along with uh drums along the Mohawk and a deer hunter that whole 
James Fedemore Cooper series. You know, I fell in love with that. And I, I, I became a reenactor to, you know, um, you know, teach history, teach people what it was like, the sacrifices of our forefathers and, you know, the sacrifices that they made along the way. And then as for the native part of it, I was always told that we had some native blood, which I still have yet to prove, which I've been working on. And, you know, I, I took an interest in the native reenactments to, you know, try to portray them correctly and properly. You know, um, it is an ongoing process to do so. I'm continually learning, you know what I mean? I'm trying to strive to do the best that I can do and be respectful when doing it as well, you know. Thank, thank you, thank yeah. you very much. Mr. Suniga, can we hear something about how you ended up in your position at Colonial Williamsburg? Yeah, so I, I kind of stumbled into uh, living history um, in my late 20s. Um, I had grown up going to powwows and participating in powwow culture and, and things like that, which is drastically different than, than living history. Um, mm -hmm. I was in the Coast Guard for a while, and then uh, when I got out, one of my buddies is like, hey, man, you like to talk? We're, we're putting on an event. We, we need more Indian people for it. You know, I'll help you get kitted out. I'll, I'll get you stuff to wear. You know, we just want some more Native people at the event. And I was like, yeah, sure, man. Like, whatever. You're, you're going you're gonna to pay me some money. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll, I'll go out for it. Um, and I ended up really loving it. You know, history was my favorite subject as a kid in school. Um, I really like talking about history, but I don't like the idea of being a teacher. Uh, I know my own limitations and I don't like parents, uh, even though I am one. Uh, and I like being able to give kids back way quicker. So uh, I currently work at Colonial Williamsburg. And so we see people from across the country and across the world. Um, and we talk generally about uh, native folks in the, the city of Williamsburg, but very broadly um, native folks throughout the entirety of the period of the revolution. Uh, and for us, we're not portraying characters, which is I think what Williamsburg is most famous for is folks being Washington or Lafayette. Uh, but with our program, we're out of character. And that allows us to answer a lot of contextual questions about prior to contact and then all the way up into, you know, today. Um, so that's, that's kind of where I'm at in the living history profession. I do it for a living, that's my job. That's awesome. Thank you very much. Um, for the next part, um, recently some reenactments have been impacted because of objections raised by tribal representatives or members. This year at Jacobsburg, Pennsylvania, those wishing to portray Native Americans <coughs> were banned from participating. Also this summer in response to a complaint, the Battle of Bushy Run resulted in this statement by Howard Pullman of the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission. To continue this programming without evaluation and significant input from those tribes connected to the battle would go against the best practices and ethics of the public history field and would be a sign of disrespect to those who have voiced their opposition to this event. He continues that the commission is concerned not with the reenactment itself, but rather the lack of consultation with the groups whose stories are being told. Um, what do you think are some of the issues involved that are causing these dissatisfactions? And we will reverse our order, Mr. Sneaka first. I, I think the, the statement kind of hit on it. it. It's lack of consultation. And so I've gone to Martin Station, I've gone to Fort Frederick in Maryland, um, and you're, you're very much, in a lot of cases, relying on the individual who is uh, there to be well-read, to have a good understanding of, of the event, of the culture. Um, and, and oftentimes that's just not happening. You do have people, and I know non-Native people who, who portray Native folks at Living History events that are very well-read and do a very good job of it. And I know a lot of folks that, that don't. And so when you look at it from the perspective of tribal communities, of tribal nations, that is in some cases, the general public's only interaction with quote unquote Indian folks is going to be these people at living history events. And so as a tribal nation, as a, as a tribal citizen, I completely understand wanting to be able to control that narrative and make sure that what people are saying 
what people are doing, how people are dressing are an accurate representation uh, of, of your community in that time in that time period. I would say I think the other the other big issue is that museums and historic sites, for the most part, especially I would say more here on the East Coast, um, have not had a great history with reaching out to native communities or broadly speaking communities of color in general. And so I think it's now just coming to the point where people are politically aware enough um, and they want the general public also wants that authenticity of they want people from the community telling the stories of those communities. So I think it's a, a twofold issue. It's trusting people that that nation, those citizens don't know from anyone else to tell their story. And I think it's also a want of authenticity from kind of the general public um, to see Native people portraying Native people. Very much. Lawrence, do you have more to add to that? I'm just going to sit back on this thing for a minute. You know, um, I'll let the other guys go. Go ahead. Okay. Like Drew. Drew? Sure. Um, um, I think the main issues are twofold. The, the first is indeed the lack of communication with Native communities of both federal, state, and unrecognized status, which is further the feeling of being ignored by Euro-American Euro academics. Um, had these communities been consulted with those historic sites in the first place and allowed to create a dialogue of what is offensive to them and what isn't and, mm -hmm. and set an adhered, an adhered to guideline of what they considered appropriate historical dress, as well as having the right to ask those individuals who do not come from either, th either three communities of status why they wish to interpret as, historic, uh, interpret as historic representations of those tribes, I think we would see way less complaint Secondly, strict clothing standards need to be adhered to. It is incredibly insulting and embarrassing, and this kind of goes along with Martin's points. Um, it's incredibly embarrassing and insulting to have large swaths of people claiming in some cases to represent your ancestors in clothes that are nothing more than historical costumes. Um, and I think all of us have seen this and know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, this needs to end. Um, and I think also, you know, kind of going on Martin's point, you know, I've also met a lot of non-Native people who are very knowledgeable, very well read, and do a wonderful job. But as I've kind of stated that, you know, you also have, you, you also have people who do a terrible job and are wearing more historical costume. And that really, really needs to, to end. Okay, thank you. Mr. Yellow Bear. Well, Drew and uh, Drew pointed pointed to something that that's been something that that I've been pushing for a long time, and that is absolutely historically correct dress as far as as far as what whatever native nation you're portraying, you know, um, you know the Abnakis don't dress like the like Drew's Drew's tribal nation, and and we don't dress like the Virginia Indians down there. Okay, there's totally different and separated. Okay, even though we may be Algonquin in linguistic stock, uh, we did not dress the same. Um, yeah, that and, and part of this other other piece of this is inviting uh, inviting the native people to participate with some of these uh, reenactments and stuff. I know up here. Uh, we're kind of isolated, and and our native people, the my wife's people, the Passamaquoddies and the the Penobscots and Micmacs and the Maliseets, are really far removed from here, and they don't have. Um, when we're doing all these reenactments, I mean, a lot of these people don't even know their own history because of the because of of their lack of of any interaction with any anything else you know and the problem problem becomes uh when we're trying to incorporate some of them into our into the reenactment world um they have no idea what their own stories because they're so isolated they don't know their own history unfortunately and it, and it comes down to uh, a, a point of having to teach them their own history times, which is really sad. 
uh, it's it's kind of frustrating actually because they should know their own story. Um, right. Yeah. That's 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 where that's how I happened to 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 learn is I had to learn it from non natives. You know, I mean that's how I learned. So. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're hearing some very similar um, ideas from a lot of you. Um, so. I don't think that what any of us want is for the story of Native Americans and their contributions to the continent's history to be ignored or left out of reenactments because of the fear of controversy. Given that only a very small percentage of the general population is interested at all in reenactment and a smaller percentage of Native populations shows an interest um, what can, what can we do? What are some of the key elements that it has for acceptability? And you think, uh, you know, if we had a checklist, what would be on that checklist for, for a reenactor or somebody starting an event? Um, are there particular things that might cause objections? Um, who, how do we know who to talk to? I think that a lot of people that trying to organize events have difficulty identifying who the stakeholders are. And um, it's, it can become a, a real block to understanding and trying to talk to the right people when it, you're kind of cast out on the sea trying to understand um, cultural groups that are very far flung and often themselves quite fragmented. And as you mentioned, sometimes aren't, there's no interest in their history. so. Um, how do you think we can move forward? Can can there be some kind of checklist or list of people to talk to? Um, mm -hmm. We'll start with Mr. Yellow Bear. Well, right now I'm uh, in in collaborative work with my wife's uh, my late wife's uh, people, Pat McQuaddy, out on Pleasant Point, and uh, I'm dealing with uh, a new guy at the museum down there named Donald Soctoma. Is really, I mean, not Donald, uh, Dwayne. Sorry, uh, Dwayne Toma. Sorry, I get uh, sometimes I get all these names in my head and I <laughs> get them all confused. But anyway, Dwayne Toma is his name, and fantastic guy. Uh, he knows everything that's in the museum, and I. There was a bunch of us that went up on a tour, his first official tour uh, of his new position as the new director there. And uh, so, you know, when we when you think of a, of a museum, you think of something that's been really well done. Like, I don't know if you've ever been to the Mashantucket Pequot Museum or the Jamestown, uh, the the one down there in Virginia, I can't remember the name of the 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 Powhatan, the Powhatan one down there. Um, I haven't been to that one, uh, but I've been to the Mashantucket Pequot Museum, and 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 quite frankly, it's one of the one of the for something that doesn't move. I mean, it's static, but you have this. You can go through this with a tour and all that stuff. Uh, it's it's fantastic, but there's no movement. There's no there's no uh, no life. There's no life ways. As Drew said before, you know, we're trying to trade life ways uh, in a in a in a way that that it's everyday life, right? And so our our thing is trying to uh, incorporate Native people into their into their past, so that they so that they can teach their own history, but they don't know it. You know, um, so what we're doing is trying to create something up in the up in the down east area to invite them to come down to learn their own history, so that if they would like to do that in the future, if if they want to teach it, you know, like we're doing, we teach history, we teach life ways. Drew's very good at it, and I've I've done it forever, and and. Um, so, you know, it's just one of those things where, you know, we're doing it in a respectful way so to incorporate the Native people into that, to get the young people interested in that, it's, it's very difficult at best because, 
you know, they're into video games and they're just like everybody else. They're not interested in history stuff, you know? So it's, it's, it's literally, it's, it literally comes down to almost like pulling hen's teeth because you're trying to get them interested in something that we're passionate about, but they don't have any idea of what it was like back in the day. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Shaptar Ravis? Sure. Um, I think to answer your first question where you're asking um, about, you wouldn't want any of us, um, you know, that none of us would want the story of Native Americans and their contributions to the continent's history to be ignored or left out. Right. Uh, to address this question first, um, I agree. I don't think anyone wants Native people and history to be erased from public, public history again, because let us not forget that a practice that a practice that had been done, that this has been a practice that had been done for well over a century that has only recently changed, that Native people were not included in public history. We were not included in town histories. We were not included in national history. And this is, we're still working on this, but this has only just recently changed. I'm only 30 years old. This has only recently changed in my lifetime. Um, and that's honestly shameful that it took that long. Um, what needs to happen is historical societies, museums, and historic sites need to actively reach out to Native communities and let them know that they wish to have accurate representation of Native people at their site. And, and is there anyone in their community who would be interested in coming out and thus eliminating the controversy? I think, I think the big barrier with this is that no one is going to these communities and this kind of ties into who are the stakeholders, but no one is going to these communities and asking them and asking them, who would you say, who would you recommend us to contact? Who would be good for this position? Who would be interested in doing this? And I think if these museums and institutions enacted that sense of humility and went to these communities first and said, listen, this is our idea of what we want to do. We want to work with your community. We want to work with your elders. I mean, we want to build this program using your history. Um, I think a lot of this controversy would be eliminated. Um, to answer your second question, uh, given that only a very small percentage of the general population is interested or financially able um, to participate, you know, how um, and that Native people participating is much smaller. Um, I believe you asked that question, correct? Um, and that, you know, will volunteering have to continue because Native representation is so small? Um, and to be honest, I believe that, um, I believe that's a false assumption. It really depends on what you want to interpret. That will be, that will be your cost factor, you know, guns and clothing being the most expensive. Um, most established units go out of their way to help new people and as much as, as much as they can. Um, to answer the question, however, I think decisions like this will deal entirely from site to site, whether they are private or public or state run. Um, the fact, fact of the matter is that a private institution uh, can hire and do what they like. And if they quote unquote want to hire natives, they and they might, you know, take anyone with feathers in their hair, to be honest. Yeah. Um, that's their prerogative, unfortunately. Uh, however, I believe that public public run sites and entities will likely be more strict and adhere to state and in some cases federal guidelines. Um, but also I think that some of these private sites need to be careful with with uh, reenactors and living historians selling crafts. Um, because that might be in conflict with um, the Indian Arts and Crafts Law. Um, and that right. was something, something that a friend of mine who's um, a state-recognized tribal member um, told me about. And I said, you know, I never thought of that. But that's very important. And that's something I think some of these sites should keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Lawrence, would you like to address that question? Yeah, I'd like to say a couple things. You know, they, they definitely brought up some really, really good points there. You know what I mean? I mean... <clears throat> Give me one second here. As a, as, as a reenactor, you know, I mean, I do believe that the research can be done out there, and the research has been done for guidelines. And do I believe that there should be guidelines? Yes, there should be guidelines. You know, um, I've actually stepped my native reenactment back a little bit to not dress full on but I've more incorporated myself as more of a ranger or somebody who has, has fought with them, you know what I mean, to, to depi depict that. 
you know, I know that, uh, you know, there were there were a lot of infusions and stuff like that, marriages and stuff like that, where, you know, people were accepted into the tribe as full-fledged members, but that doesn't work today, you know. Um, but I, I think, like Drew said also, you know, we could reach out to these local communities and, and see if somebody wants to step up. But if nobody steps up, then, you know, it's up to us to do the research and, and, and to continue to do it on because, like, we do not want this story to die especially in today's culture where everything is they, they try to cancel it or push it out of the way so so it gets lost like look at all the you know statues and stuff that they're tearing down and stuff like that just try to erase history and you know in in my mind i think it's just a, a a point to try to erase the history you know and and they're trying to you know stop us from 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 accurately portraying or being you know teaching people what it was like you know, anybody can teach. Yeah. That's pretty much what I've said. So that's that's that perspective, Mr. Seneca. I think I think there's a, a couple issues. I think, especially here on the East Coast, it is hard for uh, it is more I, I would say more difficult for historic sites and and places like that to get in contact with communities because oftentimes those communities are no longer located in the states in which these reenactments are happening. Um, I would say, I would, I would push back a little bit against uh, the statement that younger folks aren't necessarily interested in their own history. We're seeing a, a really huge revitalization from uh, folks in their 20s and 30s and teens here in Virginia and North Carolina of, of talking about traditional clothing, talking about traditional culture, learning traditional skills, revitalizing language. Um, I think it's being given the opportunity to, to explore that. I would say some of the issues with living history is, in fact, the, the financial cost of it. The, the cost of a gun can be anywhere between a few hundred and a few thousand dollars. Finding people that are producing historically accurate fabrics and reproduction clothing is, is not uh, cheap either. As, as someone, I procure that kind of stuff for work, and the folks that are producing quality textiles, it's getting less and less and less. And you're buying from a smaller grouping of people, which means of course, as, as stock gets harder to find, the, the costs go up. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, I think there's a, a kind of a multifaceted approach to it. I think the other big thing is a lot of reenactments tend to focus on um, kind of what Drew hinted on earlier, that's that single facet of, of conflict in the war. And I think there would be far more buy-in with Native communities if you began to have a more expansive story of culture, of life ways, of societies, of things that that really show civilization. Because I think as somebody who does this for a living and talks to hundreds of thousands of folks every year, I think that's the biggest thing that a lot of Americans are surprised about or a lot of our foreign guests are surprised about is we talk about music, we talk about governance, we talk about social customs and spiritual belief and uh, philosophy, and that's often left out from Indian or American Indian history. When we talk about indigenous people, it's typically surrounding conflict yep. or it's typically surrounding a tree. We don't see this culture, and, and I think that's the other big thing is they are individual cultures. Shawnee people are not Creek people. Creek people are not Cherokee folks. Um, uh, how to well make folks are not Rappahannocks. You've got all of these different communities and it's, and it's very nuanced and it's, it, it takes a lot of time, I would say, with the public to get that nuance across. But I think ultimately there are ways of doing it and there are ways to get community buy-in. And I think one of those ways is to show that this is something that isn't just a hobby but it can also be a profession. Right. It can be a way to sustain and support yourself and your family and your community. Um, I was just out at a conference for uh, Native Alaskan American Indian Tourism Association. And there are four things that most international travelers come to the U.S. for. It's the Grand Canyon, it's Washington, D.C., it's New York, and then it is American Indian and Native American culture. Anything to do with American Indian and Native American culture. And so I think there is the opportunity to 
I don't want to say incentivize, but but really show the value uh, and economics of Native people getting into the museum field. I grew up 30 minutes from where I work. I went to Williamsburg. I went to uh, Jamestown is the museum you were talking about for, for yeah. um, coastal Algonquin folks down here. I went there tons as a kid and I did not see my history. I didn't see folks that looked like me. Um, you know, my goal being in the museum field now is to make sure there is another generation of indigenous people who are museum professionals who can then go out and help historic sites, which may be a nonprofit, which may be underfunded and begin to help build those kind of stricter guidelines on these are the types of wools, these are the types of linens, this is how garments should be cut. Um, these are the kind of accoutrements you're going to see because it's going to be very different. What Cherokee folks are taking with them is going to be very different than what Abenaki and Nipmunk folks are going to be taking. And so I think that's the issue. And I think, Drew, you also hit on the issue of the sites have to be very careful about what they allow to be sold mm -hmm. because then tribes will get involved with the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. Where, mm -hmm. where does reproduction of historic objects or pieces stop and where does cribbing on American Indian um, arts, American Indian uh, historic objects begin? And I think that's a that's a, a really kind of fine line that I don't think the the living history kind of community as a whole mm -hmm. has has dealt with. Because you'll find non people selling quill yeah. selling finger even selling wampum, selling all of these things. And technically, depending on how it, they're 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 selling them, they are violations, federal violations of Indian Arts and Crafts Act. And that's just a, that that's even a better way to get Native folks involved because you have people in community that are still finger weaving, that are still doing cool work, that are still doing wampum work. If you have historic sites inviting those folks to come out and say, hey, we'd like you to come out. We'd like you to demonstrate this skill and then sell your stuff. There are going to be people here who are going to love to buy it. Um, when I was at the National Museum of the American Indian, I think that was one of the successful things when we have Cherokee days or we'd have the, the Creeks come up from Oklahoma is, you know, they'd come out and they'd show dances, they'd show clothing, and then all of their traditional craft folk were there, craft people were there selling baskets, selling pottery, selling all of these traditional things um, that they've been doing since time immemorial. And they had 50, 60, 70 people coming up to the museum. And so I think if you can show and make it worth Native people's time uh, to do it, they'll get involved. I think the, the one thing that I've experienced of, of, uh, as a hardship of getting Native people involved is it is very hard as a Native person to day in and day out educate non-Native people about who you are. And, and doing that for free for a lot of Native people is not an entertaining prospect at all. Yeah. <laughs> that is true. So, so we're hearing lots of things about the need for greater education, um, the need for leveraging our knowledge to make what we do to educate people financially. Um, there's financial incentives to that. Um, and Mr. Sinega, you touched on one thing that I was gonna bring up toward the end here. Um, I was listening to a talk by Dr. Joe Stallman. He's the director of the <coughs> Seneca Iroquois National Museum, and he was asked to do a talk on the 250th, and his statement um, more or less was, I don't want to talk about war anymore. I want to talk about peace. And that's sort of what you all seem to be saying is life ways, how to wrap mm -hmm. them in and uh, increase the depth of the experience. And as you know, with uh, traditional historical reenactment, there's some of that, it seems to be on the rise and on the increase. So I think with the 250th, there's a, there's a real opportunity to expand that narrative beyond military actions. Um, so, so I think that's helpful for people to understand. Now, I don't wanna finish um, before trying to, trying to pin us down here and say, if, if somebody wants to do an impression of Native Americans in the reenactment community and is just getting started, where can they start? What are, what are some places that we can learn? Where can we go? Who should we talk to? Should we 
be just doing book learning? Should there be apprenticeships programs? What are your thoughts about trying to get things moving in a good direction with this? <clears throat> I am going to have to apologize. I'm going to have to back out. We have a structure fire here and are calling for help. So hey, Lord. I'm going to have to bail out on you guys. I'm sorry. I apologize, but Thank I have to go. Thank you, Lawrence, for your attention. Okay, let's start with Mr. Yellow Bear on um, what can be a step one for a historic site or a person to start moving in a better direction? Well, I, you, you just touched on one of them that, that have been really, really pushing for, uh, and that's apprenticeships. Um, because uh, I think that if you have an apprenticeship, somebody coming in that absolutely no, has no idea what they're doing or, or has no, no concept of, of a, a reenactment or what it is that they're trying to do, you, you have, as, as the teacher, you have a blank slate to work with that you can mold them to make sure that they are doing it 100% correct. All right. So I didn't have that when I was growing up. I was, it was trial and error, um, just like I'm sure a lot of other people started out, you know, they started out doing, you know, buck skinning, uh, rendezvous, that sort of thing. And then, it, and then, you know, some of us kind of got disillusioned with all that nonsense and, and, wanted to progress to what we were supposed to be doing in the first place. So we progressed by trial and error. So with an apprenticeship, uh, to me, would, would be a benefit for somebody else to come in and, and learn from what I've learned so they wouldn't have to go through all the wasteful spending that I've had to go through, you know, that, and if, Mr. Nika says, you know, that is absolutely correct. What he just said uh, before is if a lot of this stuff is cost. It, it's, it costs so much money to, to get into reenacting and it's not even effective, right? So especially the guns, Drew knows about this. He, he yeah. bought one from me. <laughs> uh, I am a custom gun builder by trade. That's what I do uh, when I'm not reenacting. And, um, but you know, when you're, when you're trying to apprentice somebody else, you know, they, they can watch you and, and they can, when you're portraying, doing the portrayal, the way you're supposed to be doing it, you know, whether it's in respect with who you're, you're, you're portraying, um, you are are gonna do it in a way that that's not disrespectful. Uh, you're hopefully you're not gonna be drinking, you know, doing all that nonsense. And I've seen that happen too. Uh, I've seen non natives after a battle reenactment, and I'm not gonna mention the site. Uh, I don't think that would be fair. But uh, I've, I've seen this happen more times than I care to admit that, you know, once the battle's over, they start drinking. That's, that was, that's the whole thing. And that just drives me crazy. You know, that's not who they were back in the day. You know, I know there were a precious few. I know there were a precious few that got into the rum and the, the whiskey and all that stuff. But, but not, I mean, working about a bad enactment or at a site that you know after the battle's done you just go back and start drinking your brains out oh that's it's crazy you know for yeah. me if i'm if i'm going to be doing the doing the the life ways i'm not going to drink in any i don't drink anyway but that's that's the perception that people have of native people as drunks all the time you know we see it in our modern world and i'm getting tired of seeing that Unfortunately, that's just act life in, yeah. in the bird districts, you know. Um, so so one of the things I'm hearing is that it, it might be who some of the historical reenactment um, organizations to come up with um, behavior protocols for on I agree with that. 
on yeah. event and after event that would be helpful? What do you think about that, Drew? Um, I think to answer your question, frankly, personally for me, I would strongly suggest non-Native people should not interpret as Native Americans. Um, and that goes for a lot of reasons. This is my culture. This is my ancestry. This is my heritage. And it's not, I live with this every single day. This is who I am every single day. It's not something I can take off. Um, it's not something I can put on and off. Um, and I think there are far too many people who are weekend warriors in that sense, where they can take it on and off and they don't have to bear the same responsibilities that I do. You know, I'm a cultural ambassador. I have to think of my community always in everything that I do with every person that I meet. I am a physical representation of my community. When I interpret, which I do as a second job. So every point that Martin made with that, and I made a lot of points in some of your other questions, that it's so important for us as Native people to show younger people that this can be your job. If you work hard enough and study hard enough and learn hard enough, this can be your job. This can be something that can sustain you and fill your heart and be meaningful because there's so many jobs we do just to keep the lights on that aren't meaningful. And for me, living history is very, very meaningful. It's, it's very special and important. Um, so I would strongly suggest that non-Native people should not interpret as Native Americans. Um, However, the clause to this would be if they wish to be quote unquote adopted, or if they are claiming that they are white men that are dressing as Indians in that sense, such as Lawrence had kind of hinted on, this would be your clause where they have to, where they openly state that they are not Native Americans, that what they're interpreting as are Europeans who were involved with Native American culture, which we know historically is very true and very accurate. But yet again, that's a site to site personal preference thing. Um, I would hold true that I strongly believe that non-Native people should not interpret as Natives. However, however, if a private site chooses to override this, because remember, they're a private site, they have their own rules and legislation. If a private site chooses to override this, I would strongly suggest that with whatever time period they portray, that these sites ask their interpreters to spend massive amounts of time and energy researching and learning the historic landscape, have a fluid knowledge of primary source material, and learn to create and have a strict clothing guideline created by a partnership of Native communities, historians, and site managers that uses correct and documented materials for that site and location. Um, and also that if this override does happen, that any print material that museum or organization creates that has non-Native people interpreting as Natives needs to openly state that those interpreters are not Native Americans. Okay, thank you. Mr. Tanika, would you like to say something further on that? Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of uh, in between. In, in, in most cases, I would say that I would not suggest that any non-Native person uh, dress and portray themselves uh, as, as a Native person. I think you would be hard pressed to find uh, another grouping of folks that that would be appropriate for in any historical context or any other historic uh, uh, event um, portraying outside of your own race. Um, that being said, I think there are partnerships that you can begin to create with communities um, to have them uh, helping folks. And, and even if it's to the point of uh, the historic site having some of those bigger pieces on hand for folks to use. You know, if they want to have a, a battle scene and they want to have Native folks involved, then maybe look into purchasing a, a couple of, of, of guns that can be used. That's, I mean, that was my biggest expense, getting into living history as a hobby and then moving it from a hobby to a profession is firearms are not cheap and maintaining <laughs> firearms are not cheap. Right. Um, you know, you can, you can find linens and wools that are passable they may not be the most historically accurate but they're passable but you're very quickly going to know whether that firearm whether that uh ball club or paddle club or hatchet or tomahawk whether those are right or wrong are going to be far more glaring to most people than um say the wool isn't necessarily quite the right blend or it, or it has some um, modern synthetic in it. Most folks won't be able to tell. You'd be able to feel the difference. 
but most folks aren't gonna be able to tell at difference or at distance. I think uh, what uh, the other panelists talked about too, I think alcohol consumption at, at living history events is rampant. I mean, just rampant. Mm -hmm. I've, I've, yeah. I've worked at several museums that do living history events. <clears throat> and the one protocol we have or at the one museum we had at, at Jamestown was you cannot drink in front of the public. You cannot drink during the day. When the event is over, when the site is closed, if you are camping there and you wish to imbibe, then that is fine, but you cannot do it in front of the public. You cannot be drunk. You cannot be intoxicated. You can't, you know, you can't do it during open hours when you're there to, to talk to folks. Um, and I think that would be a, 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 a positive thing for a lot of historic sites that have general interpretation by the public. Because I think a lot of living history, a lot of the, the side culture is is drink. And I personally don't drink. I used to, but I, I personally don't. But I, I understand the allure of it. I understand the, the social camaraderie of it. But I also think you can restrict that until, hey, until the public's gone, don't break any of that out. And I would say that across the board, whether it's people who are interpreting Native folks, whether it's people who are interpreting free and enslaved Africans, whether it's people who are interpreting European colonists, like, Keep, keep the drink out of the public eye and wait until the site is closed. And then whatever you do in the off hours is whatever you do in the off hours. Um, I think an apprenticeship program would be a, a kind of an amazing thing. I think there are opportunities to kind of build that into something for the community. So uh, down in Cherokee, North Carolina, you have the Warriors of Anagadua who talk about culture and language and songs and dances and they also a lot of those guys go out and do living history events as native people at historic battle sites um, but they've also brought it in a way where the tribe can now utilize that to do outreach to schools they do outreach to military bases or whatever else and so they're now uh, learning it they're dressing in historic uh, fashion and then they're utilizing it outside of the benefit of, of a singular historic site and I think that's the big thing. Uh, I would say living history, especially the older you get in history, the less and less young people are involved. Right. Because frank, frankly saying, most young people we do not have, I, I don't know if I would even consider myself a young person anymore. I'm, I'll be 36 <laughs> this year. Um, you know, most people my age and younger do not have the expendable capital to go out in the woods every weekend and dress in historic clothes and do reenactments, which is why you see kind of the popularity of um, World War II and World War I reenacting blowing up because it's much easier to get your hands on those items because they still physically exist in many cases. Whereas now, if I want a finger woven bag, I have to either do it myself or in my case, I don't finger weave. I have to go to a craftsman who is one of a handful of people still doing it and I may pay six or seven or eight or nine hundred dollars for a bag. I may pay a thousand or more dollars for a gun easily. And so it's hard to get those folks involved when there is such a steep incline. And I think if you want to have Native folks involved that may be on the, the site, uh, whether it's private or, or public, to find some of those things and keep some of that accoutrement around. OK, we're going to buy some bags. We're going to buy some quill work if that's appropriate for the area. Uh, we'll buy some guns. And then now all you're asking folks to come in and have is a breech clout, leggings, moccasins, maybe a shirt, but not even necessarily having a shirt. You're, you're kind of diminishing the cost, of the, the buy-in cost from community members and, in, and frankly, young people in general. Right. I've gone to reenactments and, and reenactments are not getting any younger. If anything, reenactments, the, the, the population of folks participating is skewing older. And some yeah. of that's folks are retired and they have more time. Some of it's they have more money available to, to have those kind of expenditures. But living history in general is not going to su survive at all if we can't get younger people in into the hobby, into the profession. And I think that's the issue is, is, is capturing, um, capturing is probably not the best word, but, but it, it enticing and, and incentivizing younger folks to be involved in that and in, in telling that complete narrative. Thank you, thank you. Um, we do have some, a few minutes and we can maybe take a question or two. One of my takeaways from our discussion is what I think part of what I'm hearing is um, 
I came into the discussion thinking, how are we going to populate reenactments with Native Americans that are real Native Americans? What I'm coming away from is if that's not working, we need to rethink whether we're going to be doing it that way or not. How do we, how can we revision it so that we're not having to leverage folks who are not of that ancestry to do these events? Um, so that's a change in, in my understanding, I think, at this point. So thank you, gentlemen, very much for that. Um, at this point, is there somebody in the audience that has a question? I'm going to repeat her question to you so you can hear it. So, yeah, um, I'm, I'm not American, I'm an Indian, I've been in certain South American. So, one thing, I have a little bit, one thing I keep on being in school is like, let's kind of have my like, where do you have like American traditions here? When do they teach, like, when do we have like a nice, you know, base that the kids can share and learn about the like, American traditions? For example, in my country, we have the tradition of uh, like my little classic, and we share, you know, the tea, and we right. have a day for that. Or we have the 24th of May, like when we had our first presence, and then we share like food that was right. Um, right. And so you're talking about your, your culture then. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so um, the sorry. question <clears throat> seems to be this is a, uh, someone who has come from another country who is making the observation that in that country, traditional um, ways of doing things are taught as part of the regular curriculum. And um, she has not seen that happening in public schools but here. We learn, we learn about right, yeah. And that learning about uh, natives in that country is part of the, and their ways are, is traditional. We do have some curriculum things in New York state and other states, but it seems like, um, what she's she's noting is that there's not the emphasis on on sharing life ways in the educational system as a whole. I mean, yeah, I, I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. I would I would a hundred percent agree with that. And I think some of it becomes the difficulty of there are fifty states, and even within those states, there are in some cases hundreds of historic Native communities and nations that reside. When you look at Virginia from uh, the capital Richmond. Uh, east of the Chesapeake Bay, you have 40 different Native nations just in that small tidewater region alone. And while they have uh, a lot of kind of broad similarities, and they get that's how they get taught. They get taught as the Powhatan chiefdom. It's not a singular nation. It's a governmental structure that is made up of lots and lots of different tribal nations that have slightly different dialects and language, that have slightly different kind of life ways and skills. And really, those are the only folks to get hit on. The Iroquois and the, the Eastern Siouan speakers, where my folks are from, where my citizenship lies, um, they aren't really taught at all in Virginia. And so it's, in Virginia, it's, it's second and fourth grade. You get two grade levels to teach all of the Indian history of this country. And it's, it's an absurdity to think that there's going to be any level of accuracy in that. I think what compounds that, at least in Virginia, is because you're talking about these interactions at such a young level uh, or such a young age group, I think people are, are more hesitant um, to have a kind of open conversation or a realistic conversation of what these, some of these interactions were like. And they're not all great. They're, they're not all fun, funzy interactions. And I would say that's the other commenting on why it's hard to get any people involved. This isn't a, a romanticized time for a lot of native communities and native nations in their history. You're looking right. at them uh, in the snapshot of European colonization, where for thousands of years, they were the dominant societies in their area. And these battles are marking the beginning of decline in, in right. rapid change right. in culture. And so there's less romanticism around that, I would say generally for communities of color in, in living history than it is for kind of dominant Euro-American society who gets to portray the, the frontiersman, who gets to portray the American soldier fighting for independence and liberty. I think there's a lot more romance around those uh, non-people of color, those, those Euro-American kind of impressions in living history in general that people can be proud of, where I would say specifically for Native communities, you're looking at the beginning of, of rapid community change and, and really 
decline in political and, and social sovereignty. And so it's, it's hard, like Drew kind of accounted earlier, I, we don't get to take that off. I'm yeah. an Indian person regardless. When I go get gas, I'm an Indian person. Yeah. And so the things that people say at a museum or at a living history site, they're not saying, you know, if they say it's a revolutionary war soldier, that dude's not a revolutionary war soldier. He's, you know, Jim and he's an electrician at the end of the day. But if they say it to me, I'm an Indian person. And so if, if the public is going to be um, aggressive or, or stereotypical or racist in any way, I think that also hurts bringing Native people in. And so I think sites also have to have a huge um, safety net and security net for people from communities of color if they expect them to participate with the public. Yeah, and I, I think that's something that um, is not really on the radar of a lot of people that um, there is, is, is a great weight of hard history that has to be borne. Right. And it's, it's not only expensive and a long learning curve, but it's emotionally and spiritually very hard, a very hard thing to do. Um, so, And I know I just kind of wanted to, to chime in. I, I, you know, I think Martin really hit the nail on the head there. I mean, I really agree with everything he's saying. And I think too, like Martin was saying, is that we're such a big country. Who do you focus on? There is not mm -hmm. one collective American Indian history. Um, like I work, for instance, I work with South Americans. They're from Ecuador. And in Ecuador, most of them, they're not Quechua, they're Incan descendants. And the Incan Empire was, you know, was for a lot of countries in South America. And it's almost, even then, it's not a singular history. But in Ecuador, they have this sense of this unified history because they're all Native American. They are all Spanish. Um, and so they, and we don't have that here to the same because we're this big, huge melting pot of a country. Yeah. In Ecuador, they are all Native American. They are all Spanish, that this is all of their history. Um, and I, we just don't have that here. And I, how do, what do you focus on? You know, right. I think, I think it's very important also for, you know, having a multitude of communities. I can't tell you how many people don't know my community exists. Right. Um, yeah. And yeah. I think it's important because Maryland government tried very hard to make sure that nobody knew our community existed. Um, yeah. And it's important, I think, too, on that level is to have that education where we do have those conversations with local tribal people and right. have the public see us. Um, but I agree with Martin, too, that, you know, you know, these things, there's a lot in that that's how do you, you know, that with kids so young, how do you pal not palette this, but how do you make it understandable to them? Right. Um, because yeah. these are such big concepts. How do you make this understandable in fourth grade? Yeah, you know? and that's, that's one of the issues I think is that the curriculum um, doesn't consistently carry through the grades to the point where the kids can begin to real have real understanding. Is, right. Is because I think it's important also like to have more of those structured realist like very truth heavy conversations with say high schoolers middle schoolers right um, where they can conceptualize understand and understand the gravity of those situations and those people where someone in fourth grade really is not going to have this so I think you know I feel very much and I don't know if Martin or John if you feel the same that schools kind of really sweep our history under the rug as kind of quick as they can. It's like third and fourth grade, done. Let's move on to the rest. And it's like, you should continue having us as a part of this lesson because now you've just kind of kept us in the past. Um, yeah. And I feel that really that really needs to change. Well, and, and I think to hit on Drew's point is when you, when you look at... I'm oh, just, sorry. I'm sorry. I just, there's one more question that I, I would like to, this person, yeah, be, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm 72 years old and I have in the past, and 30 years ago, done teaching in the public school, in the auditorium to all of the grades. Okay. And I bought my culture, you know, from a Taino Indian mm -hmm. from, from Puerto Rico. Okay. And I brought all the, the deities and, and Everything that was on the stage, and I spoke to them. It, the, the principal called me the, the following day. And, you know, okay. Like, oh, yeah. So, so, you know, so the call. comment is. But I want to make okay. a point that she said one of the mothers called because when the boy went home, he was adopted. 
He was adopted okay. by a Caucasian family. He was a Taino Arawak. And he went home and he said, I'm Taino, I'm Taino, I'm Taino Arawak. Whereas before, he was just there right. and was, wasn't, he, he didn't know right. who he was. Yeah. He wasn't active and he just came out of that shell. Because right. it was taught in the school. So, so uh, this wonderful lady is an educator, and she has shared that um, by going into the schools and addressing all the children in the grades, that um, folks who are of Native American ancestry learn more about themselves and can take on um, the the essence of who they really are as in their development, and so that a more consistent approach to teaching the um, culture seems seems to be helpful in a lot of ways. So, yeah. Can I address that? Oh, no, well, actually, unfortunately, we are at the end of our time now. Oh, our program. Clearly, we should be doing a whole series or a week long. There should be a week long conference on this, perhaps at some point. Um, I think what I'm hearing is is helpful and will be helpful to people discuss more. And um, my hope is that when we start planning events, some of the things that we've talked about today are very much on the radar of people who are trying to organize events. Um, and we'll reach out and try to talk to the community more. Um, certainly there would be very helpful for the increased funding, increased outreach programs, um, however we can. So I think we're gonna have to leave it at that partially, only partially begun conversation. So I thank you. I'm gonna turn off the recording shortly. Thank you all for attending. Would you folks like to let them know your appreciation? Thank you very much.